This video is looking at section 1.2.1 .1, risk assessments in sport and preventing injuries. So objectives for today's video, um, what I'd like you to do is be able to identify the risks associated with participation in physical activity. Um, this will give you enough knowledge to access the GCS GCSE grade D questions on an exam pa paper and this requires a uni structural level, level of thinking. We're just looking at very small elements here. And then obviously, I'd like you to be aware of how to reduce these risks in sport. Um, this is then linking together more skills. So you'll be looking at being able to answer GCSE grade C questions on, a, on an exam paper. So very briefly, um, most physical activities in, and sports have some element of risk attached to them. Um, this sometimes can be higher in certain sports, both in terms of an accident happening and the severity of the, the injury that can, can occur. However, quite a lot can be done to minimise those risks and that's what we're going to look at to start off with. So, first one, warming up and cooling down. Now, one of the main reasons for warming up is that warming the muscles up gradually helps to prevent injury. Um, and then obviously cooling down serves not just to prevent the injury but to help get rid of something called lactic acid which we'll look at in more detail in a, in a future topic area. This helps to prevent muscle soreness and muscle aches. The next area we'd look at is checking equipment and facilities. Now organisers and officials as well as participants in sports need to check for safety before an activity or competition. Um, organisers generally check that the facilities are safe and secure and that any equipment is in good condition. Now the specific checks needed will of course vary consider considerably according to the activity. Before a football match for example, officials will check that the pitch is okay, um, that the nets are secure, that there's no um, implements on the field that are going to injure anybody. Um, you might remember um, an official running around with, with a fork testing to see whether the ground is frozen um, and if it is they might call off the game. The next thing to focus on would be protective equipment and clothing. Many activities call for protective equipment and clothing and some such as football, hockey, sailing and riding have the need for such equipment built into the rules. Um, the clothing may also vary according to the position you play. So for instance, in, in hockey, goalkeepers wear more protective clothing than the rest of the team. Um, and that's true um, in a sport such as cricket, um, where the batsmen will pad up and wear lots of pads to prevent um, any injuries. It's also really important not to wear clothing that might injure an opponent or potentially a teammate. Um, one of the major things when we're talking about protective equipment and clothing is the fact that jewellery should not be worn or if it needs to be, in the case of wedding rings or earrings that can't be removed, they need to be taped up um, so that they can't injure anybody else. Now one of the most important items of equipment um, to think about to protect yourself in a sport is footwear. Um, most sports require specialist shoes or boots. Now apart from helping performance, it's always safer to wear the correct footwear. So in contact and invasion games, it's easy to see why this is so. So if you think about football boots, they have studs to give grip. Sprinters need sprinting spikes for better grip to help them run faster and so it aids performance. But they can also injure other athletes if they tread on their feet. Uh, jumpers, especially triple jumpers in athletics, need extra prote protection in their shoes for when they land, um, especially in the hop phase where lots of forces are going through the foot and the leg. Footwear which is worn for safety reasons m needs to be designed so it can't be damaged. So before a Premier League pl um, player is allowed onto the pitch, the football boots must be checked for the damage to the studs to make sure that they're not too sharp, they're not too blunt, they've got the right length. Now moving away from contact sports such as football, road runners um, need specialist footwear as the pounding the roads takes its toll on the feet, ankles and knees as well as the hip joints. Now shoes are clearly the most important part of a runner's equipment and must be chosen carefully as each foot lands about 800 times in a mile. Um, running shoes can be very expensive as a lot of research goes into producing them and choosing the right ones is very important for comfort and support. Now what I'd like you to have a little think about is um, choose an activity that you're most familiar, familiar with and list the equipment you'd need for a typical training session. Now choose one of the ob obvious activities that you do, so such as football, netball, hockey, um, and write about it for me. Alternatively, 
I want you to have a look at the different types of footwear on the internet that you can wear for different sports. Have a look at how they're made, what shape they are, what do they have on the bottom? Is it a rubber sole? Is it a flat sole? Are the grooves? Why would they need these things in those sports? So at this point in the video, you need to pause it and go away and do that activity. Now, another way to ensure um, risks are minimized is to ensure that we have something called balanced competition. Now, uh, when creating a balanced and fair competition, there are certain factors that need to be considered. Now, the first one we're going to look at is called weight categories. An example would be in boxing. So, in sports such as boxing, the competitors are matched according to their weight as well as their ability. Now, this is necessary to protect participants' safety. So, for instance, a 7 foot 20 stone professional boxer obviously can't um, safely take on another boxer who's only 5 foot tall and weighs 8 stone. Um, weightlifting is obviously another one there. Um, it's divided into weight divisions in order to equalize competition. This isn't actually for safety purposes. Karate and Judo, on the other hand, are examples of activities that have clearly defined skill levels and where players take part according to their ability. Another element to balance competition is mixed or single sex. Now this is uh, particularly important, um, especially in contact sports. So in most sports, men play against men and women play against women. Netball, hockey, football, cricket and rugby are all examples of these. Athletics and swimming are also divided by sex on grounds of fair competition, although not necessarily on grounds of safety. Some invasion games, such as hockey, can be played as mixed sex. Racket games, such as tennis, badminton and table tennis, can be played as mixed doubles, and this gives a clear opportunity for men and women to compete fairly in open competition. The next area would be age. Now, competitive sport for very young children has been quite controversial issue for some time and some people think that too much competition at an early age is bad for children. Children's competitions are normally in age groups but um, as you've probably seen in, in your own school life talented performers do sometimes get, get to play out of their age group. In terms of safety overuse injuries are frequent among young athletes although being grouped by age does not guarantee that the players will be of equal height and weight and that the little ones do not play against big ones in the same age group. If you think about your PE lessons in year 7 to 9 maybe, when you were doing rugby for instance, you were obviously competing against some very big lads and maybe against some um, very small, small boys as well. We also have something called a handicap system to ensure balanced competition. Now this is another way um, to ensure that the competition is fair and equal. The obvious example would be uh, in golf, it's a way of ensuring that players of unequal ability can play in direct competition with each other. So for instance, a handicap system would allow you to go out and play with the likes of Rory McIlroy on an even par. Now another element to ensure safety and to minimise um, the risk of injury is to ensure that performers play to the rules of competition. All games and sports have rules so that there can be um, fair competition. Rules help to ensure safety and help games flow. So in the, if we look at football, for instance, when the ball goes out of play, it can be restarted by a throw-in. Otherwise, potentially, you could have a game running on into the stands or into different towns or villages because there's no game boundaries. To punish poor behaviour, um, if any of you saw the Super League final um, at the weekend, there was an incident where a, a, a player punched another player and they got an immediate red card. So obviously it's to, to stop things like that happening in, in the activity. And then obviously occasionally in sport we have something called professional fouls, where players deliberately act to stop or affect play. Um, Particularly this happens in team games, so you might be the last man and you might just push someone over. Um, Behaviour like this goes against the spirit of fair play and it needs to be avoided as, uh, at all costs really. Over-aggression or professional fouls can cause serious injuries which could threaten a player's career. Um, because of this, players can be heavily fined and banned for over-aggressive play outside the rules um, and it's classed as going against the spirit of the game. So you've been given lots of information about 
risk assessments and preventing injury. Make sure you've got all the key points, notes written down. There will be a short quiz on the VLE, which you'll be able to access. Um, complete that quiz to check your understanding.